everyone. I'm Jackie Schaefer, Vice President and General Manager of Stella. It's another year and we're back. So we're mixing it up a little bit uh, this year. For as long as I can remember, and I've been doing this webinar, I guess, um, I can't recall doing it with anyone other than my colleague, Connor Smith, CEO of the Bosch Group. In fact, you saw his picture before I hit uh, start on the broadcast here. Well, unfortunately, Connor couldn't be here today, but my ride or die partner, Brendan Durr, is joining me. Brendan is the VP of Enterprise Sales for our family of companies. That includes Stella and the Boss Group. Happy to be here, Jackie. Got some big shoes to fill. We're both really excited to bring you the latest and greatest trends and stats about the in-house creative industry as featured in our latest publication, the 2019 In-House Creative Industry Report. For those of you who have joined us before, the agenda is going to look familiar. We'll use about 30 or 40 minutes of this hour to overview the structure of the report. Then we'll dig into what I call the foundational metrics about our industry. Then we'll turn the conversation to the wonderful world of metrics. Next, we'll talk about money, specifically some trends in the chargeback space. Following that, we'll hit on some new questions we asked this year, labor market challenges, and interesting finds we we found when we started digging into the data. And then what's left with this hour, uh, we'll take your questions. Each year, we're really fortunate to receive more questions than we can possibly answer, but we always do our best to try and address as many as possible. So please feel free to submit your questions throughout the presentation, or you can wait to the end, but use the question pane in your GoToMeeting control panel to do so. As I reviewed a draft of this year's report, I remembered our, what seems to be annual commitment, coming back to you and saying, we're gonna look at the length of this thing. Um, we know it's very long, and we did trim some questions this year, uh, but as those of you who took the survey know, we didn't necessarily shorten it for you either. Um, but I hope you'll agree that's because we've added some new valuable content. So we've added sections on agile practices and capturing and reporting of metrics. We've also expanded our video questions. And to the more than 400 of you who took the survey this year, thank you, thank you, thank you for supporting this report, which is the most comprehensive source of benchmarking data for the in-house creative industry. I mentioned the new topics we added this year, and here's a look at the evergreen topics we've been surveying year over year. Each of these topics includes a set of related questions to support your strategic planning and in-house evolution. So, for example, in the process section, not only will you learn about agile practices, but also the prevalence of quick turn processes and partner surveying amongst many other process questions. The PDF version of the report that you're gonna have access to no later than tomorrow afternoon has bookmarks to help you navigate and find what you're looking for very quickly. So at Stella and the Box Group, we are focused specifically on serving the needs of in-house creative agencies and their teams and their leaders. This survey is limited to in-house creative organizations and we only accept responses by leaders because those are the folks who know the full breadth of the answers that we're looking for. Um, we have all major industries represented as well as a broad range of team sizes, company sizes, and funding models. This diversity allows us to collectively understand where the industry lies, but it also helps us understand when differences such as what industry we're in, the size of our teams, which funding model we employ, and even the size of our company, when does that actually matter and when does it not matter? Because realistically, 80% of the challenges in health agencies face are really alike. It's only 20% that are unique to those things. Okay, let's review perspectives from the field. Each year we've released this report, we've in included these articles. They're really best practices or thought leadership type articles that are written by industry leaders out in the in-house creative space. Um, so you'll find these articles throughout the report, and they're bookmarked in the PDF as well. Our very first article comes from Jarrett King. She's the director of Coca-Cola Studios down in Atlanta. Thank you very much, Jarrett. Um, she explores the possible leadership choices for in-house agencies and makes a case for the type of individual best suited uh, to successfully lead these organizations. Um, next is Christy, Christine Molinaro. She is a contracted consultant through Sella, serving as interim general manager of uh, Becton Dickinson's in-house agency up in New Jersey. Christine has managed a number of teams that have been very geographically dispersed and largely consisting of remote workers. So she's going to share with us some key insights, starting with how to successfully hire the right resources and tactics to keep uh, remote creative teams engaged. 
Next up is Frank Beck. Thank you very much, Frank, for your contribution. Frank's a manager at the Boeing Company's in-house creative studio, and specifically he oversees uh, XR renderings and animation for their team. And he's going to share with us how Boeing has successfully used augmented reality and uh, virtual reality to give viewers an immersive tour inside aircraft and uh, demonstrating clearly the right application for the right creative solution. Thank you very much, Frank. Uh, Matt Galemo is our interactive team lead inside Sella's Embedded Studio at Merck Creative Studios. Again, he's based in New Jersey as well. Matt has worked with a number of uh, external agency partnerships over the years. He's outlined five principles for partnership that will enable you to strengthen and benefit from your external agency relationships. And then finally, that handsome fellow there is Danny Rickard. He's our uh, digital media lead here at Sella. He spent the last decade leading video, digital, and creative teams in both operational and executional roles. Uh, video and content production services are an ever-growing need, and we've seen uh, many in-house teams feeling hesitant to begin building this offering due to the uncertainty about the type of talent uh, equipment and all the processes needed to stand these teams up. So Danny writes to us here to share how to build the right video team, and that's beginning with identifying the critical roles and enthusiasm needed for this dynamic team. Um, so some more resources to uh, walk you through. In past years, we sprinkled the reports with links to external sources related to the topics of each page. And a lot of those links have been to the great articles that Sella's experts have actually written over the past few years. And our pages were getting too crowded, so we wanted some more white space. So this year, we've created a resource section for your wall at the back of the report where we've organized the articles by key subject areas. Um, and uh, we just chose articles we felt would be most relevant given what we're covering here. And there are many more articles than this available on our blog. So if you haven't seen it, go to sellaconsulting.com and check out our blog. We've got something coming out every uh, two to three weeks on that blog. All right, so now we're going to start with some foundational data points to, to sort of get things started here. So this next set of slides feature benchmark, benchmarking questions you've seen for many years if you follow it, uh, the report. Though each, year, uh, the, though each year the survey attracts new creative leaders to the audience, so this is always a good place to start. And along with the 2019 data, we're going to show you these results alongside uh, either year-over-year -year data or with some data cuts that don't appear in the report. Um, if you like data as much as we do, we do, this is the time to geek out over it. Um, the, rep the reporting division is uh, a question that a lot of our clients ask uh, when we're out and about meeting with clients. What, what part of the organization should uh, an in-house agency report up into? Um, we uh, ask this question around 15 different areas of the business, marketing, sales, communications, IT, finance, shared services plus an other option. Uh, we find these teams report to literally all kinds of different places within the organization. We do sort these 15 options into one of two groupings, strategic and non-strategic divisions. Um, our labeling here is not to devalue groups uh, who report into what we label as non-strategic groups. By the way, we're, we're simply acknowledging um, there are different challenges for groups that are reporting up to a shared services division versus a marketing and communications division. And certainly with, within many of those creative teams under shared services, there's an incredible, uh, there is incredible and valuable work being produced. So just wanted to point that out. And typically, the more closely aligned to marketing communications, the more a team is, is viewed as part of the value stream versus a third-party agency. But that said, there are advantages to being aligned with shared services as well, one being that you're typically tasked to grow uh, in order to support a broader base of clients. Okay, looking at the data here. So into which department does your creative team or in-house agency report to? So back in two, uh, 2014, we saw that 77% of teams rolled up to a strategic division. That number has risen since then to 83% now in 2019. In the report, we do present the responses to this question at a more granular level, but here we're simply presenting the roll-up to strategic versus non-strategic. The size of these teams, we always look at that every year. How large is your creative services team year over year comparison? So this is a question we'll continue to ask year over year. And while this year um, there was very little change, we have seen more dramatic changes across the years between uh, over the last five or so. Um, and just as many of you have read in other industry publications, perhaps the ANA's report on the continued rise of the in-house agency, um, the in-house agency space is growing in terms of the number of companies 
who are building these teams. But in fact, if we look at back at our data to 2013, we really see how, how the number of in-house agencies is not only increasing, but the team size is increasing as well. I really am excited by this statistic. When you take those two things together, um, one is that more companies are starting in-house agencies, and then you marry that with the fact that the companies are increasing their investment in in-house agencies through demonstrated through team sizes growing. That proves not only is it a smart move economically, that the teams are creating value, which is, which is everything. It's very exciting. Sure is. So we also look at revenue band. How large is your creative services team by revenue band? So we shared this stat last year, and people seem to appreciate this stat, so we brought it back again. We're often asked how a company's revenue affects the in-house agency team size. Um, there's definitely some alignment between revenue and in-house agency size. However, it's also about a company's decision on how to invest uh, or direct marketing and communication dollars. In fact, we've uh, actually consulted with quite a few Fortune 500 companies over recent years who have no in-house creative team at all, and often for very good reasons. So it truly does depend on a company's own decision-making there. Um, but here on the left, we have companies with less than $5 billion of annual revenue. And on the right, we have Fortune 500 sized companies. And as expected, the larger companies are more likely to invest in larger in-house creative teams. All right, let's talk about money. I am always especially interested in funding model data and how it impacts things like team size and, and the team's ability to grow. So while being funded as a chargeback, it's not the norm. You can see that here. Um, but when you are a chargeback, it is incredibly um, huge in the management of your team and understanding of the factors that it relates to. So we looked back across nine years that we've been uh, publishing this report, and this benchmark actually hasn't moved a lot. Um, it's pretty consistent that about a third of the industry, plus or minus 5%, charges back for services. So to me, that's a little bit boring. I like when there's some change and we see things moving in one direction and, for, and another, and we can draw correlations as to why that might be. So how can I make this more interesting? I want to look at funding model by team size. And as you watch the blue sections grow as you move from left to right, that's more interesting to me. And it tells us something that I think we've all kind of known, but the larger your team, the more likely you are to be a chargeback group. Um, at the far right here, you see that almost two thirds of mega teams. A mega team is defined as a group that has 50 or more uh, folks in their in-house agency. So two-thirds of mega teams charge back for their services. The average is 36%. So you can see small teams it's less, are less likely to do it. Mid-sized teams are right there around the average, and large and mega teams are much more likely to be charged back. We saw another interesting change this year that actually gave me pause, and I, I might even say concern. So chargeback groups are set up to do one of three things. So they have to cover some of their costs, and this is called a subsidized chargeback group. Uh, or two, they have to cover all of their costs, their full cost recovery being the goal. Or three, profit. Um, most groups fall into that subsidized category. So for example, they might have to cover all of their personnel costs and their direct operating expenses, but not their overhead, because overhead might be seen as a sunk cost for the organization. And this helps keep the rate a little bit lower and um, in line with the true cost of business. But here's the thing, profiting is usually very rare. And in my opinion, it goes against the goal of an in-house creative team. So colleagues should have a financial incentive to use us, the cheaper rates. And if you start asking us to profit, we, be, we become less cost competitive. Um, so I don't know, my point of view on this is that when we're asked to profit, it's a way of kind of taking back marketing and communications dollars and not really allowing marketers and communicators to invest them into other projects. Um, if any of you are profit centers and there's something more you want to share with me here, I'd love to hear from you because I really hate to see uh, in-house agencies becoming profit centers. So the way we charge our clients typically happens in one of three ways. The first way is a blended hourly rate, right? So all the services we offer are charged at the same rate. Typically, let's call it $90 an hour. Uh, the second way we might charge our clients is through service-specific rates. So this may be done that you charge one rate, let's call it $100 an hour for digital work, $90 an hour for offline work, and maybe you charge $80 for project manager work. There's 
one approach, and please don't use that as a best practice. That was just illustrative in nature. The third way you might charge clients is with flat rates or deliverable-based pricing. So, for example, you have a rate card and it says um, brochures that are eight pages are going to cost $8,000 to create. Uh, I personally don't like that model. It seems like it's easy because, you know, there's flat rates and you can tell everyone exactly what things are going to cost. But I believe that creates a lot of churn in your project management space when folks are now measure, measuring estimates and actual um, and scope incredibly close. And that scope is, becomes inefficient. Or rather, that managing of that scope change, managing that budget becomes inefficient. So there was a small shift in 2018 and 2019 towards simplification, which I like. I like a lot. Um, where we see more people moving towards that one single blended rate. That being said, I don't want you guys to think that's the best way to do things because as much as I like simplification, I also recognize that the more diverse your service set is, the more likely you need service-specific rates. So in goal, just try and keep it simple is the goal. And if you have service-specific rates, can you have three, can you have, can you have four, maybe five? Don't have 12 or 15. That doesn't make things less complex. When you are a chargeback group, you almost always want to ask other leaders of their teams, like, what your chargeback rate is, right? And I, I hear that conversation a lot when leaders ask me another. And it's apples to oranges in most of the cases, right? Because I could say $85 an hour, Brandon's team might be $100 an hour, and what does that mean? Um, and the discrepancies can be based on several different factors. So where your business is located, clearly New York City is more expensive than Columbus, Ohio. Your company size can play into your cost because overhead at a Fortune 500, Fortune 100 company is typically more than a smaller organization. Going back to what I mentioned previously, your recovery goal is different. If I'm, one of us is re required to profit and the other one is subsidized, that's largely going to change our rates. And then one of us has offshore resources that's going to change our rates. So there's a lot of different things to consider when you look at rates. That being said, we can look at them, right? <laughs> so you can see here in 2019, about a third of our respondents indicated that their blended hourly rate is $80 or less an hour. Um, another third approximately falls right there between $81 and $100 an hour, and the remaining third is above $100 an hour. There's actually a shift between 2018 and 2019 in these numbers. Uh, last year, you saw almost a little bit more, 51% of folks had a chargeback rate of $80 or less. That's a dramatic shift, but it also a little bit aligns with what we saw on a previous slide that there's a shift away from subsidized charging back models towards full cost recovery and profit models. Our last slide here on chargeback rates is for the service specific chargeback rates. Um, we have across 10 or 12 different categories here where you see the green highlights. That's where the majority uh, responses or significant responses exist. The other thing to point out with these ones before we go too deep into them is the sample size. You'll see it in the far right hand column the average number of respondents is around 30. So it's not a huge sample. For, and so when you see, you know, 9% of people do this, it's, that's three people do this. Um, so keep that in mind if you're using this to be too directional. I think it's just more interesting in nature at this level. Um, what kind of I find perplexing is some of the things we're not charging for. So creative direction, copywriting, uh, project management, these are things I think you should be charging for. Um, they should be seen as value-added services. Proofreading definitely fits in there for me, um, though I get it because I actually was that leader who didn't charge for proofreading 10 years ago because my clients, for some reason, um, wouldn't pay for it if I charged for it directly, so I just charged them more for everything else um, because we all know our clients need proofreading. <laughs> um, and then account management is one that we often do not charge for, so that doesn't really surprise me there. Um, but the one that kind of blew our mind is if you look down underneath video production, the bottom one, 17%, so about six groups, so it's not a lot, but still 17% of people are not charging for video production. So we're going to be watching that one and see what happens in the future there. Mm -hmm. Very interesting. Thanks, Jackie. And I'll just point out as well, we're not going to cover it in today's webinar, but when you get to the actual report that you can download, you will see a section that covers the uh, advantages and disadvantages of a couple different funding models for creative teams. So beyond just the, the data and uh, the rate discussion, we see in-house agencies uh, being significantly impacted based on the funding model that they do deploy within their organization. And there's definitely a, 
a best way and a right answer for every different company uh, that we've worked with. But just to say that uh, that'll be some material for you to check out when you read into the report, because it's not only about the numbers, it's about how uh, the funding model fits into within your culture and with your, when you, within your financial operating environment uh, has a significant impact on team, team performance. Um, so we're going to start talking about the work. Let's get to the work. Um, digital versus print is the first topic we'll focus on. So what is the percentage of team hours spent on digital projects versus print projects? And last year we introduced this question to learn how digitally focused teams were becoming. We've actually heard a lot of teams start to call themselves as digital first teams. It seems to be a hot uh, term people are using, but we simplified the question this year to simply learn whether the majority of a team's efforts is being spent supporting digital projects, print projects, or whether the work was pretty evenly distributed. And, and what we learned was that almost 40% of teams address a pretty even split in their print and digital work. About a third are more print-based, and uh, just under 30% have, a, have a, uh, a larger load on the digital side. So this does represent a slight 5% shift from print to digital over the last year, and I wouldn't be surprised to see that trend continue. Social media, hot topic for in-house agencies, um, consistent with last year's 86% of in-house agencies who are supporting their company's social media efforts in some way. Uh, it's not included here. I'm sure that that uh, level of effort has increased within those same respondents as well. Um, the most commonly provided deliverables include graphic components at 97% there at the top, video 72%, and photography at 67%. 40% of these teams total also provide content, such as blog posts and tweets. Um, another hot topic on in the area of social media is where these teams live. And of all the different clients that we've worked with, uh, this could be all over the place. <laughs> there really is no one place to go and find the social media team at large corporations. However, as one might expect, it often most, uh, most often falls in the marketing or communications teams. Um, but correlating with other reports, we've read very little social media content is actually created outside of companies today, uh, with less than 10% of these respondents reporting that content is managed outside of their organization. So most teams are already doing it, inside and companies are outsourcing very little of it. You take that and you marry it with the fact that our respondents in this survey said that social media is one of the top three service offerings creative teams see increasing in their future. And we think we all, all see an area here where the in-house team can potentially add significant value. Well, that's a long list. So increasing services. <laughs> so which of the following service offerings do you see greatly increasing in the future of, of your group? So this list has actually doubled uh, in the past year. And what this tells us is that teams are just more and more being asked to take on many new kinds of work, new types of deliverables, new channels, always simple. Um, two of the top three responses didn't come as surprise, the video and social media in there. However, what is really exciting this year is to see that 40% right there near the top of in-house agencies anticipate uh, the work they're doing around marketing and communication strategy increasing. And that's really exciting to see. This list is a little bit overwhelming. Um, that being said, I think a lot of teams can make a lot of check marks as they go down this list of services and they're already doing them. And as you think about what you're going to be adding to your list as you're evolving your services, it's really important that you focus on where your key strengths are and identify where you add the most value to the business. Because you just can't be everything to everyone, right? So you have to look to evolve, but be really smart about where you place your focus and make sure you do just that, focus. So the new questions, we're talking about agile practices, metrics, and video, the relentless needs and topics in our industry right now. Agile. I like to talk about it in the terms of big A and little a. Uh, it, it's a really hot topic, and it's a pretty enough, tough nut to crack in the in-house creative industry. Mm -hmm. According to an external report, 37% of marketers are using agile practices today, and a whopping 61% plan to build it into their workflow next year. Now, personally, I'd like to see the follow-up report, how many of those 61% actually do build it into their processes, because it's just not as easy as any of us think it would be or would like it to be. We're currently hosting a roundtable series on Agile. At the end of this uh, presentation, we'll tell you the dates and how to, how to look to see sign up to those. Um, but what we're learning is that the number of in-house agencies that have implemented Agile is pretty low. 
The report, however, it gives us a slightly more optimistic view uh, in that one out of four creative teams are currently using agile methodologies. And maybe not surprisingly, but maybe a little bit surprisingly, small and mid-sized teams are using it for a majority of their work, whereas large and mega teams are using it to a much lesser degree. So just if I back up from this um, uh, from the slide here and look at it, the way I would read it is small teams, so we'll go with 71 to 100 percent of their work, small teams, 36 percent of small teams are doing 71 to 100 percent of their work in an agile method, whereas zero percent of teams of 30 or more people are doing 71 to 100 percent of their work with agile. So it's much more prevalent, prevalent in the smaller and mid-sized teams. And you might argue, and I don't mean this to be a bad joke, sounds like a dad joke or a mom joke, but um, small teams are able to implement Agile, big A Agile, probably because they're a little bit more little A Agile. It's easier to make changes. They're not steering the Titanic. I have a few good dad jokes if you need one. Your wife told me that you shouldn't tell anymore. <laughs> <laughs> so when we asked folks, like, why aren't they implementing Agile right now? The number one reason was a lack of experience. 61% of teams, they just don't have scrum masters on their team. Very few in-house agencies have that role. Um, also, it's not being done consistently. How do you apply it to the creative space? Uh, and lastly, just general resistance to change. 42% of folks said that their teams are resistant to this agile change. So to help with this, um, stay tuned to Sella's emails because we're pretty close to releasing a new white paper on agile in the in-house agency. We've done a lot of work reviewing in-house processes and identifying where agile practices can be applied at different stages based on different tiers of work. Metrics, metrics, metrics. Um, I really love metrics. Uh, it's kind of an enigma that I ever was a designer. I don't know how I ended up there, but thankfully I've ended up where I probably belong. Uh, this is the first year we captured benchmarks on metrics. Um, what are being, which ones are being captured and how are they being used by in-house teams? So here you can see that two-thirds of teams are capturing and reporting metrics. I'm really excited by that number, and I'm hoping to see it grow when we report on this next year. But here, here's something pretty interesting. 67% of in-house teams report metrics, very close to the number of teams that track time. That's a correlation, people. Uh, time tracking is the foundation of most operational metrics. And just a small PS, um, it is 2019. Who are the 11% of you who are tracking time in a manual method? Can we please help you call us, please? So people just really like spreadsheets. Um, yeah. All right. Um, what, what metrics are you tracking? Um, we put metrics into four different categories here at Sela. Uh, service metrics, product metrics, process metrics, and financial metrics. So in those products and services categories, the most commonly tracked metrics are about the type of work being done, how complex is it, what type of deliverable, about who we're doing the work for, so which clients, which business units, and then how our team's time is being used. So again, what clients are we working for, on what type of work, um, which exact projects are driving the most value. On the process side of things, the most commonly tracked metrics in this category are focused on job status, scheduling, and rounds. Wouldn't it be awesome to know the exact number of rounds that clients go through on average? I'm hoping that that number doesn't look like 17, it looks more like five. But if you have that, you cut that data, Brendan, right, by client, we can see that one client does average 17 and most clients average five. Mm -hmm. What a powerful way to change behaviors, having data behind it. Absolutely. So who is tracking metrics? Well, we saw earlier, it was almost two thirds of all teams, I think it was 69%. Um, the key takeaway here on this slide is that large and mega teams are more likely to be tracking metrics. 89% of them are tracking metrics today, and they're using it to measure team capacity, plan their resources and their staffing. They're also using the metrics to benchmark against the industry and increase transparency for their business partners. All right, I'm done geeking out over metrics. <laughs> <laughs> we all know you love them. Okay, getting into video. So video, do you provide video production services? Video continues to be a, a key service offering with 70% of teams now providing this service compared to 55% back in 2012. So significant amount of growth there and um, outside of the data here, I, I think we at Sella would also know how much these same teams 
have actually evolved to take on much higher value uh, video work uh, within the scope that they're completing for their company. So, uh, but most internal video teams are still serving a balance between internal communications and external audiences, although external has become the majority there. Um, looking at team sizes, how many dedicated resources support video services, dedicated meaning 100% focused on video. Uh, with the explosive demand for video, uh, the team size correlates to the in-house agency size in total, and more than half of small teams are now relying on uh, one resource which is sort of a step above from a partial resource <laughs> historically. Uh, more than half of mid-sized teams are relying on one or two resources. And then whereas 63% of uh, large teams have four or more resources and 66% of the mega teams out there, again, mega teams is teams of 50 or more, have six or more resources. So one change uh, we were excited to see this year is that video teams are increasingly relying on specialized roles uh, versus jack of all trades roles, which is kind of a has been kind of a common trend in the video industry. Um, so within their teams, that means especially for producers, editors, and video graphic designers, teams are more commonly staffing those in a, a more uh, dedicated fashion as opposed to jack of all trades skills. I'm excited about this change because. Moving to specialists is going to increase the quality of the output of these video teams. You know, it's very common in small teams that we're starting up a new function that we ask people to be jack of all trades. But as we evolve that function, like we're seeing the video teams evolve today, we do specialize more. So for folks who are seeing that grow, don't keep adding hybrid roles over and over. Look to create specialization as your team grows. Okay, we're going to talk about the people now, and uh, especially the talent market. So talent market confidence is something we've talked about year over year. Uh, the question is, what is your perception of the available talent in the marketplace right now? Last year, we were actually stunned by the results um, of our talent market confidence survey questions. Creative leaders' perception of talent availability and data we were seeing coming out from the broader employment market and the staffing industry in general didn't really align. Um, so, in short, in-house uh, creative leaders found that there was enough talent out there to fill their openings, while the industry and our own extensive recruiting operations in the space were telling us that uh, we are in the middle of one of the greatest talent shortages in a generation. So, uh, one of those reasons, though, was probably in the structure of our own question, so we've made some changes there. So, for this year's survey, we added an option to allow respondents to opt out of responding by indicating that they have not hired for a specific role in the past year. Um, to that end, we did see a, the data shift a bit away from a significant majority finding uh, there to be enough quality talent out there in the market. Yeah, there's still a disconnect though, right, Brendan, that folks think there's enough quality of talent, but really it's far more limited than they're perceiving. Yeah, and this is only my personal theory, Jackie, but I, you know, uh, hiring managers are more connected to people in the industry than they ever have before, ever have been before. And um, I, I think what conflicts with that is the actual ability for those folks to hire the, the folks in their network within the confines of a corporate in-house agency. There's a lot of barriers to, to entry for talent in that way. So just a theory. Um, the labor market in general, so let's take a look at some trends. Uh, employment rates for persons 25 years and older by educational attainment, seasonally adjusted. So over overall, unemployment rate was at 3.8% in February. And for college-educated professionals, that number was at 2.2%. Based on our industry experience, I would guess that talent within the marketing, digital, and creative sectors, especially talented talent, uh, is, is going to be at an even lower percentage than that. Um, the Fed has stated that the U.S. unemployment, uh, I'm sorry, the U.S. employment market is near or beyond near full employment. So what this means is that we are all hiring people away from current jobs that they're actively working in versus hiring people who are uh, predominantly out of work. Um, after years of stagnant pay, wages increased again this year. So wages were up 1.9%. That's a bit uh, less than last year's at 2.9%, but up nonetheless, I will say there's certain skill sets within the, the marketing, digital, and creative space that are increasing much more rapidly than that, but we won't call those out today. Um, what this means to all of us though is that uh, quality candidates can continue to be in high demand and the cost to employ them continues to rise. And in fact, a major concern for economists right now is the labor market is too high, um, and that could potentially derail economic growth as companies struggle to 
uh, find the workers that they need to keep up with the demand. Oh, okay, let's, let's get a little more uplifting here. <laughs> yeah, exciting <laughs> stuff, huh? <laughs> All right. So, so, as we went through the report this year, there were some things that stuck out to me. I, I thought were kind of fun as an interesting word choice that, uh, that is probably my responsibility of making that. But uh, they're interesting at very least. So the first one is in global operations. In 2018, the primary, the most common primary reason for having an international creative team was to support the local business partners. And it was like in the lead a lot, 83%. In 2019, that dropped to the second place position at 35%. It dropped by more than half. That is so curious to me. Um, the number one reason moved to have additional business hours or to follow the sun. Um, the end here is really small, 23 people each year. So we're going to continue to watch this and see if strategies are changing um, across the teams that have global operations. I love this change we made. Okay, so last year we asked this question here on the left. How do you use your non-personnel direct operating budget? And this is literally how people spend their money and they select all that apply there. This year we switched it up and it's like, if you had more money, how would you spend it? And what I really like is that the top four responses all have to do with engaging and or developing their team members. This is huge and I think I think that our creative leaders um, community is really smart because it is a hot talent market right now and ensuring that your folks are happy and fulfilled is really important. Your compensation strategy, especially in the creative industry, is a small piece of that. The community, the experiences they're having, their ability to um, an opportunity to develop further in their expertise those are the things that drive the creative community. So we all know where we want to put our money. We just have to figure out how to get it there. We ask this one every year, and there's a soapbox that I like to stand on. I'll try and contain myself here. But last year, in blue slice, you see here, 54%, more than half of in-house creative agencies didn't survey their clients at all. So. I'm pretty excited, it's small, but I'm gonna take my wins where I can get some people. That that number dropped by 8% in 2019, and we're at 46%. So I'm really hoping this is the beginning of a trend, and we see this blue slice continue to uh, get smaller and smaller year over year. Um, if we look at these colors of these graphs, or pie charts rather, you know, so I don't wanna see you in the blue. I actually don't wanna see your team in the gray either. I think that surveying after most projects or every project create survey fatigue, and what generally happens then is the people who respond to the survey are people who are less than satisfied. And then it looks like, you know, you can't really report on your average client because your average client is the folks who didn't have the perfect experience. They're more likely to talk. We all know that. Um, and then where I want to see folks more often is in the green. You know, you have some sort of regular cadence that doesn't exhaust your client. Um, if you feel the need to have more frequent feedback, what I might suggest is surveying after major clients in correlation with some level of like annual survey. If you had a survey, one of the things you might learn from your clients is that they would really like to get low hanging work done faster. So that work that can go in and out of your in-house agency in an hour. Um, and the good news is that well, two thirds of creative teams have this and probably because their clients ask for it. Um, with 16% of them actually dedicating a team just to this. I'm pretty sure if we cut this data by team size, we would see that that was large and mega teams for the majority who have the actual number of headcounts to be able to do that. Um, and my other hunch is that of those 37% who don't have it, one, they could be small teams and find this challenging, um, but also they just haven't asked their clients yet because they're not surveying them. So there's correlation here too, I would imagine. The last one in this section is dedicated resources. So we ask this question around, do you have a project manager? And by dedicated, we mean they're not also a designer. Do you have an account manager? Do you have both account managers and project managers? Do you maybe have hybrid account managers, project managers, or do you have none of the above? Um, and just less than half of folks have none of, none of the above. Whereas, as you can see here in the pink, 36% have some level of dedicated team members here. So that's pretty exciting. But when I correlate that data with some other questions that we have, we learned that if you have account managers, you are more likely to use Creative Brief. You're also more likely to be doing tier one work, which makes sense. 
right? Because account managers, their job is to partner with our clients to develop the strategic work. We also learned that mega and large teams are twice as likely as small and mid-sized teams to have dedicated account managers, which also makes sense because, you know, getting an account, you usually install project managers before you install account managers. So typically at uh, 30 or more people is when account managers become more prevalent. So now I'm going to introduce you guys to one of our newer colleagues, Valerie Fadan. Valerie joined our team last November, um, which was a perfect timing as she was able to take over um, leadership of this report. Uh, for many years, I, I led this report, and then I passed it on to Cindy Ponce, our practice lead, and, and Cindy, she ratcheted it up and improved the quality and the overall deliverable. And Valerie in year one has already done the same again. We're very excited about that. Um, and one of the things I'm really most pleased about is this new infographic that she's created and I've asked her to give you an overview of. Thanks, Jackie. Um, so we, we created a nice infographic. Um, and we're going to just show you a couple of uh, highlights here. But what we've looked at in the infographic are some things that um, have remained relatively the same over the past five years. So reporting structure, chargeback models, um, and the agency value propositions have remained relatively unchanged. Where we did see a major shift was in the use of project management systems, with 82% of teams currently using project management systems. This is absolutely fantastic. Um, as we looked at this here, um, Brendan talked about it earlier, we saw the rise in the video services, and especially in the specialized role supporting that work. And last but not least, um, the stats around Agile and what's happening in that space. So 64% of you said you believe that Agile is actually going to make your team more productive. Um, as Jackie said, I think we're going to track this and see what happens. So for those of you that get a hard copy of this book, we set this up to be a fold out with her. So you can tear it out. You can hang it up on your wall. Likewise with the PDF. Um, it's set up in a spread. You can also print that out and hang it up if you like. Um, we hope you would join us. Yeah, and what what Valerie has shown you here is just a small piece of the overall infographic. Valerie, thank you so much for producing this report. It's fantastic. Can't thank you enough. Okay, about the survey publishers, I'm going to go through a couple quick items here, and then we'll get to the the Q and A. Um, so, Sella and the Boss Group are the producers of this report. We have been for the last nine years. And we are sister companies. We're one big happy family of companies here. Sella is our management consulting firm and managed services firm focused exclusively on helping uh, large corporations to build, optimize, and evolve their in-house agency capabilities. Some of our clients start from zero and need us to uh, come in and build things for them for, from scratch, and others are starting in a place that's well-developed and looking to transform in some significant way. The Boss Group is a nationally leading staffing and recruiting firm for creative marketing and digital professionals. We're based down in the Washington, D.C. area with offices nationwide. What many may not know is the Boss Group has been recognized for many years now as the leading uh, staffing uh, firm in the creative marketing and digital space in terms of customer service. And that's the customer service that we provide both to the customers that we serve as well as the talent we, we represent, and that's measured through our Net Promoter Score. Uh, so if anybody on this call needs any help in any of those areas, there will be contact information at the end of the presentation that you can reach out to us through. Some upcoming events to talk to you about. So Creative Manager Boot Camp is our nearest term event happening in Chicago, May 16th and 17th. We've got just over 40 people registered and only 50 spots to fill. Uh, so time's flying quickly. If uh, you have anyone on your teams who may want to come to this, this is an event for managers who are either new to their role in managing creative teams uh, managers who perhaps have been in the role in a, uh, for a while and just want to brush up on some best practices or someone else. Um, Project Manager Boot Camp 2 is coming in Washington, D.C. Uh, please don't take that number two as uh, thinking that you had to attend number one to get there. We'd love to have anyone join that, that event. Um, Creative Execs Roundtables in the middle there are going on right now. Uh, the four city events that we're holding yet in the spring schedule are there listed. Uh, but these are regular gatherings for leaders of in-house agencies to do some uh, peer sharing, benchmarking, discussing what works and what doesn't work, 
So check us out there at creativexecs.com and see if you'd like to sign up. And then for those of you who like to network within the creative industry or you have people on your team that like to get out and meet other creative uh, uh, people in your area, these are some cities where we're hold, hosting our regular networking events called Creative Connects. Okay, we did it. Got through all the data. <laughs> so before we jump into Q&A, I just wanted to remind everyone that uh, by the end of business tomorrow, you will receive a follow-up email with instructions on how to download the 2019 report. Um, you are getting access to this download almost a full week before the general public, so keep it quiet <laughs> and plenty of time to read this report before anyone else does. Um, and that's it. Let's uh, jump into the questions and see what we have queued up here. Uh, the first question is from Scott. Um, the session is being recorded and it will be shared back to you. We hope to have that live and available to you by end of business tomorrow. Uh, another Scott. Um, thank you for coming, Scott. We miss you too. <laughs> <laughs> uh, questions about social media, and I think we can kind of see qualitative, qualitative briefs of this as a group. Um, didn't survey it this year, but the question is about social media content um, and whether the content that in-house creative organizations, what we are making, is it organic or paid social media content? So we didn't go into that level of detail in the question. I think it's a great uh, deeper dive mm -hmm. that we can introduce you as we evolve the report. Um, I believe that because it was framed pretty broadly, um, it would include yeah, and I would just say qualitatively, thinking about the in-house studios that we run and the clients that we consult with, we see both. We see there are some in-house agencies that actually have listening teams. Mm -hmm. um, we have in-house agencies that are creating Facebook feeds, that are creating Twitter responses. Mm -hmm. um, it's really across the board. Yeah, and the, the eye-opener for me was we, we actually sponsored uh, some space at the A&A's in-house agency conference down in Orlando a month or so ago. And there were a whole host of vendors uh, selling programmatic and, and media, uh, client side media technologies that are going to continue to support and empower in house teams to really uh, produce creative work that hooks in right into these technologies. And I think we're on the very, very early uh, edge of companies adopting those types of capabilities and actually being able to connect creative teams that produce content in real time to some of these uh, paid media channels. So Susan asks a great question. What kinds of questions do you ask in your client satisfaction surveys? Um, we're a small team and we talk every day. So in, I would, if you do like an annual survey or a semi-annual survey, I look to elevate the conversation around, um, get it out of around specific projects and elevate it to, you know, what do you consider to be our impact to the project creative, the creative and actual strategy? Um, Talk about your partnership ethic, um, your team's um, elevation of um, the strategy, as I mentioned before, general timeliness. Like, I don't want to talk about one-offs. I want to talk about the trends of the team. But then also ask this question, you know, what are the top two or three things that we do really well? And what are the top two or three things we could do better or differently to support your business? And honestly, if you just ask those two questions, what do we do really well, and what could we do differently or better? You're going to learn some really valuable information. Um, Benjamin has a great question. He wants to know if we have any data on how many teams work with project manage management tools and which ones. And uh, Valerie showed us that 82% of teams use one. And Valerie, do you want to tell us what the top couple of tools people are using right now are? Yeah, um, far and away, um, almost 30% of teams are using WordPress. Um, and then it's followed by a much smaller percentage of roughly 10% using uh, Lira, Microsoft, SharePoint, and Write. Um, after that, it, it drops off into the single digit percentages. So WordPress by far and away the number one. Yeah, and we've seen that trend hit pretty hard over the last five years where Workfront used to be at the top of the pack back in like 2014 by just a couple percentage points. And now they're three times the next person's uh, majority response. And it's not the right solution for everyone, but it's a really strong solution and they're doing a great job listening to our industry and what we're looking for. Yeah, and I would say that's specifically driven too by 
uh, their focus on uh, producing some of the capabilities around integration and uh, metrics reporting that are often needed in the larger enterprise environment that just seems to be matching up with the, those teams' requirements a little bit more than uh, maybe some of the other solutions that are really specifically developed for creative teams only. A little bit changing direction here. Um, Natasha has a great question. Um, do we get a copy of this deck after the call as a PDF? And yes, we have traditionally provided that and we'll ensure we have it in this year's um, follow-up to y'all as well. Um, Shane asked a question, so we'll have to visit that link to get the recording and report even if we're already signed up. And unfortunately, Shane, yeah, you do have to visit a link to download the report because most of your corporate email servers will block us sending a mass email with an attachment. So I apologize that it can't be more convenient for you, but you probably wouldn't get it if we sent it as an attachment. If you have specifically have challenges with that, feel free to you know, email us one off and we're happy to do that, but the mass email will hit by end of business tomorrow. Um, Robert Cole uh, asked a great question. Do we have any events planned for the Bay Area? One of the events that we did not speak to is a new event for um, in-house creative leaders, the senior most leaders. Um, we traditionally have held something called Beyond the Creative, and we're kind of reinventing that series, and we're going to be hosting it later this year in two locations, uh, on the East Coast and on the West Coast in the fall. And Robert, we're strongly looking at the Bay Area, so stay tuned for more information on that. I guess the cat's out of the bag on that one, though. <laughs> well, I supposed to keep it in the bag? <laughs> no. Um, our, oh, Jennifer, how are you? Um, our team's tracking their error rate. Yes, they are. It was on that slide as well, um, because I'm a little bit of a, first I'm going to go back, so it's not that many slides. Um, metrics, they are. And what's really hard about tracking metrics, uh, where error rate, only 13% of teams are tracking that. And you really have to define, the trick is, what is considered an error? Does it have to be published? Does it, is it a mistake you know, before it gets to the printer or goes live? Or is it only after those things? If you can define the error, you can track it. But then where do you track it? For most teams, it's very manual today. Oh, uh, Raphael, I just answered your question. He said he's a trained in He's attended most of the trainings that we host, and he loves them, just so everyone knows, um, and wants to know if there's any new ones coming. So stay tuned for the fall. Hope to see you. Thanks for the plug, Raphael. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> um, Valerie, while we get to the next question, can you look up the answer to this one? Um, we're going to come back to the question about digital asset management systems. Yeah. So Jessica asks, a question that's a good one. What are the stats around taking creative production offshore? What are the most common tasks being offshored and what are must keeps in house? So I'm going to answer this pretty qualitatively, Jessica. We do have some of this in the greater report. Um, most common tasks being offshored uh, to typical kind of offshoring locations um, tend to be the ones that are more transactional in nature, your tier three work, things that are very rules bound and don't require a lot of real time collaboration. So Conversely, what do you have to keep in-house? Things that require um, a lot of collaboration. Your tier one work typically is best done when your creative director, your designers, your copywriters can partner in real time with their end clients. Um, uh, the other things that might be kept in-house tend to be around um, sometimes confidentiality if the work's going to be off the company servers, um, and things that are having incredible timeliness requirements. And that actually might be a dual approach that you're working, you're following the sun to make it happen. And, and, and just to add to that, um, offshore production is not re a replacement for localization. So I, I think a, there's a lot of um, confusion out there as we talk to people on this topic as to what a global model in, in the creative production environment should really look like. And those are two very different worlds. Uh, you're, you're With true offshore talent, you're approaching things from a cost management perspective or uh, and hours of service perspective, but that doesn't really solve for the challenges of being in the local markets and serving local clients that you may have uh, offshore as well. All right, so now I'm going to take us back to the question from Jennifer on how many teams are using a dam to manage and traffic their creative. So we should state that dams aren't really about managing and trafficking creative. It's more about the storage and um, search of assets, so about dams. 
So today about 52% of teams are using DAM systems, 32% um, of those using an enterprise-wide system and 20% using one specifically for their team. Um, the most commonly used systems are SharePoint, uh, Widen, which is a media collective product, Adobe Experience, Workfront DAM, and Web DAM by Finder. Thank you, Valerie. We have a few more minutes here. Um, as you look at the data, for example, team sizes, are you also looking at geographic location being a factor? Um, great question, Kristen. We do collect geographic location, but we really haven't found, um, we, can, uh, we can sort the data by uh, U.S. domestic versus non-U.S. entities, the three of teams, and we actually do get down into like your local geographies, but, but yes, we can do it. And outside of um, like chargeback rate, you're probably not going to see a lot of differences in the responses. Ah, there was a high percentage of in-house teams that didn't charge for copywriting, Anthony states. So do we know why that is? I don't know why that is. <laughs> yeah, I don't, I'll just I say don't I'll... Know why is. No, I, yeah. Anthony, we're basically flabbergasted by it. <laughs> clearly, it is a value-added service. Um, and I don't know if it might have to do with the fact, again, that in my personal experience, I'm not putting this on anyone else's clients, my clients thought they were amazing writers, um, and they were very good technical writers, but they weren't marketing writers. So sometimes when you're in a chargeback environment and you're trying to convince people to pay for things that they think they're already good at, it's really hard. Mm -hmm. Like, appropriating copyright yeah. might also be one of those things. But it's a great question, and I think next year, given the fact that we see some categories not being charged for, um, we can expand on the question and drill down a little bit. Yeah, sure. I will also say copywriting is one of, if not the most difficult skill sets for in-house agency leaders to recruit for, uh, and it's also considered oftentimes a strategic role, so companies may be allocating dollars for those types of roles in a slightly different way than they do other creative roles. Dave asked the question that I think we all wish the answer was higher to. At what level are in-house creative agencies being brought in as strategic partners? Um, in other words, annual planning time, communications planning sessions, et cetera. And I, we can tell you that 9% um, of teams identify themselves as organizational strategic partners. So we define that meaning key stakeholders in marketing initiatives, um, liaison with external agencies, primarily tier one work, um, and you can look at the rest of that uh, kind of continuum or spectrum of different types of agencies in our book. Um, but I can just tell you qualitatively, so 9% say they're organizational strategic partners. Qualitative, the answer is they've not enough. Um, one, it's certainly single digit percentages that are being brought in as strategic partners for annual planning and, and um, communication strategy. It's just it, it, it's the thing that we all want, and I think the challenge most often is that a lot of times there aren't a lot of our marketing partners don't have plans, even when you think they should. Mm. It's, it's hard. They're all working as hard and as fast as they can, too. Uh, Mike, for video services that were discussed, can you provide how those were staffed full-time or freelance? So the way we're asking the question, we're specifically asking about your full-time resources, but in the studio that we run and in the clients that we've worked with, it's definitely a large mix. There's certain roles that it makes a lot of sense to keep freelance, and there's more roles that make sense to have as an employee. So things like combination producer editors, um, producers tend to be very common, commonly exist, um, and you might... Uh, have a freelance shooter, a freelance grip. Um, you might even have freelance motion graphic designers. It just depends how consistently you have that need. Is there other data from the um, report, Valerie? No, I, I think that you've covered it, Jackie. Okay. Fantastic. Um, we have time for just one last question because we are at 2 o'clock for all of you, and I bet you're running to meetings. Um, let's see. How, okay, well, Jennifer, what a big question. How do teams track on-time delivery when that often relies on approvals from partner stakeholders that can cause delays? 
which is the legal department. Um, we're tracking speed to first draft. I love that. But there's, but that's all we feel we can accurately measure. Uh, I know Valerie can have a point of view in this, probably. I know I do. Uh, but I think that creative teams are on time 99% of the time because we have to be. Things drive our deadlines. But other people impact our ability to hit those deadlines that are out of our control, and that does not mean missing a deadline. So updating the deadline in line with things we cannot control is critical to measuring success there. Yeah, I agree. And, and I know that we um, we had this challenge with work that we were doing um, in the past um, where it looked almost like we were beyond our SLA. And what we found was what was pushing us beyond SLA was the amount of time that the work was sitting on the client side. So we really had to segregate our tracking method to track both our actual time and our client's time. And that will give you probably a better picture. Um, it is a little more complicated to do, um, but that will help you see the trends in where the work is getting done. You know, I am going to answer one last question here. Um, with the introduction of Agile, where can we turn to ask best practices? And that is something Sela is focusing on huge this year, Leah, and we would love to help you. Um, we have our white paper, but our consulting practice, we have folks who are uh, a scrum master, we have folks who are being certified, and we are, we are embracing Agile and figuring out how it applies. So please contact us, we'd love to help you. Yeah, and Leah, since you're, if you're registered on this, webinar, you will likely be receiving notification of a new white paper on uh, applying Agile to the in-house agency. That that should be coming out within the next one to two weeks, so stay tuned. Well, with that, we just really want to thank you guys for your time this afternoon. It's been a very fast hour. Um, we definitely, again, had more questions than we could possibly answer. Um, we love chatting with you all, so please feel free to reach out, stay connected, and you'll hear from us by end of business today, or tomorrow, rather. With, uh, with the download for the link. Brendan, Valerie, your first year joining me here. Uh, I, I, I will say I missed Connor because he's not here and, and he is amazing. <laughs> and you guys did amazing, so thank you so much. Thank you, it was fun. And we miss you, Connor. All right, have a great rest of your week, everyone. We'll talk to you soon. Thanks. Take care.